So since my 15 minutes could have led to a national brain drain of the poverty mafia, I decided to go way out on a limb. And you may think that I wasn't following directions, which is probably true. Uh, but I, I decided to take this question seriously and really think about what I knew about people living in poverty and think about uh, what a measure like the SPM uh, included and left out. And uh, I want to say that uh, this talk really stemmed out of a conversation I had over coffee with Sandy Jenks uh, last fall and collaborative work I've been doing with Jennifer Sykes, sitting right here in the blue, uh, looking at EIDC recipients, along with sort of a long time uh, conversation I've had about consumption versus income poverty uh, with Bruce, who uh, I was colleagues with at Northwestern, so it's really fun to be on this panel. So to go to this conversation that I had with Sandy Jenks this fall, uh, as I recall the conversation, Sandy, you said to me, what do you think is the most important dimension of poverty? Is it absolute poverty? Is it you know stuff? Or is it relative poverty, where you sort of end up in the distribution? And, and I thought about it uh, for a minute, and I ended up saying, uh, neither. Now, of course, this isn't completely true, but well, we're just going to have a little bit of fun with this. So, uh, you know, I published a book on, uh, with Luke Schaefer this fall about the rise in the number of U.S. households living under $2 per person per day. Uh, and uh, in, in the aftermath of that publication, I sort of uh, revisited uh, this, this conversation I had been having with Bruce for many years about income versus consumption poverty and which is the best way uh, to, uh, to measure poverty. So uh, imagine that I had had the same uh, a coffee date with Bruce and he asked me the same question. Uh, I think I would have probably said neither. <laughs> Uh, now, let me explain uh, what I mean. And here I'm saying, you know, okay, not really neither, but maybe both and, so I don't offend my, my fellow panelists. But let me tell you where I'm going with this. Now, uh, how many people recognize this picture? A couple, okay. So this is uh, Eastie, this is East Boston, this is Maverick Street. Uh, it's a very grim uh, building along Maverick Street. It's, it's, it's covered with a century of grime. Uh, it actually, you can't see it here, has wire mesh on the windows. Uh, over the doors, in dirty brass letters, it says, Overseers of the Public Welfare. You see that huge flagpole sort of jutting up into the air. Uh, anyone who went to seek relief from the government had to visit this building in East Boston. And it was almost as if the stigma and shame of walking through these doors uh, was a visible stripping of citizenship and dignity. To, to use the imagery of T.H. Marshall, it was as if you had to cross the road uh, from the rest of society uh, and take your place among uh, the company of the destitute. Now, I spent the first part of my career studying AFDC, uh, then TANF, so I uh, spent much time in these welfare offices and wealth welfare recipients who had uh, continually referenced the shame and the exclusion and, and the non-personhood they felt as a result of being on welfare. So fast forward to 2007 uh, when Jen Sykes and I began hanging out in places like these. Uh, we, uh, through the Russell Sage Foundation, had gotten money to study uh, what we were kind of thinking of as uh, the new safety net, uh, the EITC. And so we were stationing ourselves in H&R Blocks and other such places with large sandwich boards that said $5 for two minutes of your time. We were collecting uh, a, you know, a, a sample of EITC re recipients, and then we were following them over time to see how they spent the money. So what was fascinating about this research is what people said about this experience. You know, you got about $5,000 at this time if you were sort of in the sweet spot of the EITC beside, as compared to the other experience. Uh, in the typical state, you got about $5,000 in cash if you had no other income uh, from the uh, old welfare program or then from the TANF program. So people said things to this like us when we visited them in their homes and we were following them and looking at how they spent the money. Uh, they said, uh, I feel like a real American. They talked about the pride they felt in being a taxpayer. Now, 
I don't feel proud of being a taxpayer. Uh, but this came up over and over and over again in the interviews. It was as if, uh, you know, you're walking to H&R Block's doors, they're gonna take $200 out of your pocket, right? So we don't generally think of H&R Block as our friend. Uh, but it was almost as if walking through the doors of H&R Block and its competitors where 70% of EITC claimants file for the EITC, that these folks were taking on a mantle of citizenship. Because after all, this was the place where every taxpayer came, anyone could come who was a worker uh, to claim their tax refund. And this struck me uh, as sort of brilliant, as, as, as really revolutionary. Uh, we had you know, kind of created inadvertently a, a program to give the working poor more cash. We had done it through the tax system because that's how it was expedient to do so. Uh, but in, in, in the process of doing this, we had created a system that actually conferred citizenship, inclusion, and belonging rather than uh, took it away, okay? So here's sort of the old welfare system, right? This is a very famous uh, uh, photograph, obviously. Um, but I want you to think of this versus this. Okay, so this is an H&R Block ad. Our people could parrot H&R Block ads to us spontaneously in interviews and did so over and over and over again. Especially the two phrases on this ad, when you got Block, you got people, they say, you know, I've got people. And they also said, you know, our, they, they talked about this phrase, our people are your people. And what I'm gonna to suggest to you is that the most fundamental aspect of US poverty is that it excludes. It strips people of citizenships. It puts people across the road, joining the company of the destitutes rather than making them citizens. And of course, this is all reversible. We know this because we managed to create a program that did the opposite, the EITC. So I would like to uh, pose the following. America has traditionally used social policy to shame its poor. What if instead each program offered dignity as the EITC did? And what if all of our social policies from TANF to SNAP to Medicaid to child support, that's a big one, probably the most dignity stripping program we have, uh, to school breakfast and lunch, uh, to the local food pantry, all of them, right, rolled out the red carpet for our recipients and treated them with dignity rather than shame? What if they affirmed a sense of belonging and inclusion? What if they said, in effect, you're part of us, your people or our people? So my question is, can we steadily work to incorporate the poor by measuring their sense of belonging? I told you I was going out on a limb but stay with me for a minute. Figuring out how to measure incorporation is a little bit tricky. Uh, but if you look at the work Luke Schaefer and I have done uh, uh, in, in the most recent uh, um, extreme uh, deprivation volume published by the Russell Sage Foundation, uh, we talk about things like life expectancy, which of course <laughs> make the American poor uh, look like uh, the developing poor in the developing world in many cases. Uh, we also follow the work of Andrea Campbell and Joe Soss, uh, talk a lot about uh, thinking about things like uh, social capital, uh, measures of incorporation like voting and civic participation. Uh, the work of Raj Chetty and colleagues has shown us uh, that if we want to understand variations in mobility across counties, uh, intergenerational mobility, one thing we really have to pay attention to is social capital because it is one of the strongest correlates of which places have the strongest intergenerational mobility over time. So we, can we think creatively about expanding our conception of how to measure poverty uh, by thinking about this core concept of belonging, uh, what we're referring to as dignity, because belonging doesn't sound quite as cool as dignity. Dignity is not quite right, but what I'm using it to connote here is a sense of belonging and inclusion. Now, a few notes on the supplemental, uh, supplemental poverty measure, which is what I was actually supposed to talk about. 
Uh, my struggle with the supplementary poverty measure is that it treats five key in-kind programs as equivalent to cash. So these are housing subsidies, LIHEAP, uh, Low Income Heating Assistance Program, SNAP, our food stamp program, a school lunch, and a WIC, okay? So I've been studying the extreme poor, and I've been looking at how they've been, along with Luke Schaefer, using these benefits. Uh, and it turns out that this is not really a story of uh, these in-kind benefits being equivalent to cash. So for example, although we know that cashing out food stamps is not common, among uh, the ordinary poor, the just plain poor. Uh, we have a lot of administrative data suggesting actually that fraud has gone down. Uh, we see this is almost ubiquitous practice among the extreme poor, among those living on virtually no cash. They're expending their in-kind resources uh, at about 60 cents to the dollar in order to get that vital cash they need to buy their kids socks and underwear, to pay the electric bill, to stave off homelessness because in the world's most advanced capitalist society, it turns out that you actually do need cash to survive. Uh, we also have a lot of stories, I think, from the EITC study and studies I've done with the food stamp population uh, that many kids who are eligible for food school breakfast actually don't get it. Uh, turns out that, you know, it's, it's not very good. And uh, so we have to really think about a school breakfast, also school lunch. Um, and we also need to understand that uh, when you talk to families who use WIC, uh, WIC often gives them too much of some things and not enough of another. So a WIC almost becomes sort of a bartering tool across the community. I've got too much of this. I need a little bit more of this. And it's not always directly beneficial to the family who receives it. So I'm not saying that it's not important to measure our in-kind safety net. But as the safety net, and here I'm talking about the work of my colleague Robert Moffat, shifts more and more away from the categorically, you know, the categorically poor, uh, from cash uh, to non-cash resources. We really need to think about what that means on the ground uh, for families. I also, and I'll talk about this more this afternoon, uh, want to query whether in 21st century capitalist America there isn't something really crucial about cash. Of course, cash is fundable, in-kind benefits are not, and when you try to make them fungible, in the case, as is in the case with food stamps, you lose a lot of the value. Third, what can we do to capture this third critical element of what it means to be poor in America, the sense of belonging, inclusion, dignity, which may, by the way, show up in things like life expectancy, civic engagement, right, social inclusion. These are the two magic elements that make American communities work. And our democracy, you know, political voice, political participation uh, in our democracy. So I wanted to end uh, with this image, uh, our people are your people, and to suggest that if we really think about the experience of living poor in America, we need to consider this third dimension. You know, uh, another thing that really prompted this talk was uh, half of my appointment now is the School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins University. My colleagues go all over the world studying the very, very poor. They're in, they're in Africa, they're in Southeast Asia. And uh, recently I gave a dean's lecture at the School of Public Health and there was a, you know, all my colleagues all showed up and, and they came up to me afterwards and they said, wow, it's a lot worse to be poor in the United States than it is to be poor in you know, and they would name the country they were working in. And I, I thought this was astonishing, uh, that to a person, uh, the story that I was telling of the $2 a day poor uh, was, was stunning to them, felt to them to be categorically worse uh, than what they were experiencing in the various countries they were working in, which were, you know, if you're talking about absolute poverty, right, much, much poor. Uh, so I, I really think there's something to this. I encourage you to think about it. And uh, I just wanted to credit uh, all of my co-authors who've helped me think about these things. Uh, Luke Schaefer, uh, Jennifer Sykes, Sarah Halpern-Meekin, and Laura Tack. Thank you.